Okay, so here are five stories that helped us make $500,000. We believe every maker could make $100,000 a year selling what they make. We're Jenny and Davis. We've made over half a million dollars selling what we make. I know, I can't believe it either. In this video, we're sharing the mistakes we made along the way as we made that money. Maybe if you're wise, you can do it better and faster than us. They say a fool never learns. A smart man can learn from his mistakes, but a wise man learns from the mistakes of others. So if you wanna hear our stories, watch this video and hit subscribe so you see more videos like it. Okay, so here are five stories that helped us make $500,000. All right, first up, we were terrified to start a business. It really happened to us on accident. It fell into our laps. I was just making stuff for my house and all of a sudden our friends were hitting us up, wanted to buy stuff. And to some degree, we're still terrified to run a business. It is just a difficult thing to do. But you know what? I made money when I was dumb. <laughs> and I've gotten a little smarter every day since then. Just a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit, but it all adds up, right? Yeah. So you do not need to be prepared to run a business. You just have to be prepared to figure it out along the way. Before getting into woodworking, I thought I could sell websites. <laughs> I don't know why I've always been attracted to business even though I've been miserably bad at it. Um, <laughs> I do remember the website phase. I wanted to make the website I thought they should have. I didn't want to make the website that they wanted. And I wasn't very good at sales. I wasn't very nice about it either. And it's no wonder I drove that business into the ground. Well, when I was starting to do the same thing with woodworking, I was really scared the customers were going to get mad at me for doing the same mm. thing. And so I overcorrected. I did the opposite. The first thing I sold that got, I got like a legitimate profit on, or at least the first one I can remember, was this teddy bear box. We actually have a mm. series of videos on our YouTube channel about it. This woman, she, she was a waitress at, for our friends at a, at a restaurant and she mentioned she was looking for someone to build uh, a display case for a teddy bear. Her husband's father had passed away mm. and uh, she wanted to get this box to display this teddy bear that his dad had gave him as a way to um, just remember him. Yeah. And I wanted to make sure that she got exactly what she wanted. And so I asked this poor woman way too many questions. Yeah. I, I was having her pick the species of lumber she wanted. I remember she wanted glass windows all the way around the display case so you could see the bear at all angles. And you were like losing sleep over like, well, if I did it out of real glass, it wouldn't last that long, it would break. And she wouldn't know how to cut it down to the right size to replace it. So I should use plexiglass, but there's two different brands of ple plexiglass I could choose from. I'm gonna ask her which ones she wants. And then looking back, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like one, you're the expert, just tell her what you think would be best. Like, hey, let's do plexiglass and then just decide on the brand yourself. But back then we were so worried about making the customer angry that we did. We asked so many questions. And I probably made her angry by asking too many questions. <laughs> yeah. So you gotta find that balance of like, how much do you trust yourself as the maker and the expert mm -hmm. at building things and how much do you wanna give them freedom for right. deciding what, how much of it they want to be customized. So, and that's always been a, a struggle to find for us. So if you're starting a business, you just gotta figure out where in that balance you wanna, you wanna sit and knowing yeah. you probably lean too far one way or the other and we gotta bring those things into balance. And even though I gave her way too many options, it was okay. Like in her grace, she <laughs> answered most of the questions. And as best she could. <laughs> as best she could. And then we built the box and she loved her husband. Oh my gosh. She, she told us her husband was in tears when yeah. she gave it to him. Even though I lost sleep over it, I was so scared. I, at, at a certain point in this job, I thought about just telling her like, hey, I don't think I could do this anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I'm really sorry. I don't know who else. Like, she'd been looking for someone to do this for months and I was her like last hope and I almost bailed on her because of my own insecurities. Because you didn't feel like you were ready yet. Right. But, and but now because you took the leap and you were willing to do something that you didn't quite feel prepared for, but you did it anyways. This woman had a beautiful gift that she gave her husband and he was in tears. So it's like that happened because you started something before you felt ready. Yeah, now looking back, like how dare I stand in the way of her trying to give that experience to her husband because of my own insecurities. So. Right. The lesson I take away from this is the lesson that's on our wall. Follow your fears. You don't need to be ready, but you do need to be ready to figure it out. Mm -hmm. People out there need the stuff that you make. They just don't know you exist. So don't let your own fears and your own insecurities stand in the way. There's money to be made. There's people to help out there. It, you're already perfect to solve somebody else's problem. So go out there and meet them and start your business. So start before you're ready and follow your fears. 
All right, so the next big lesson we learned came from our inability to decide what we really wanted to make. We had built a lot, like don't get us wrong, we had built a ton of different projects over the years, but we had trouble ever making any more money than like 20 or $25,000 or whatever. Like because we weren't like specialists in any one thing. We would yeah. build a desk, a really pretty custom desk for somebody, and then we'd turn around and build a coffee table. And then after that, we'd build a military retirement gift or a small jewelry box. And then after that, we built a bookshelf. Like we would go back and forth and we never really got to develop our skills. I was even like welding stuff. It wasn't yes. just wood. So like it wasn't just different woodworking projects. Like I was trying to figure out if I should incorporate metal into some of the yeah. designs, but I was because becoming a jackass of all trades and I wasn't getting good at any one thing. The customers kind of struggled to put me in a box to know how to tell people about me because right. it wasn't just furniture because I was making gifts and it wasn't just gifts because I was making furniture. It wasn't just woodworking because I was making metalworking stuff. Yeah, you stuff. were doing some metalworking. And so, and then we'd put, incorporate like glass into some projects. And so it would, it would be hard to listen to our friends describe us to other people. They'd be like, oh yeah, I have these friends. They build furniture and then like sometimes they'll do military gifts but then there was this one time that they welded this really cool thing for me and we're just like oh my gosh it like hurts my ears to listen to people describe us to other people like we need to have something more streamlined so people can describe our business our business within like one or two sentences mm -hmm. but we just couldn't decide on what one thing to stick to I guess I was just afraid of turning away money yeah, that's and fair. I didn't want to say no to any job, but by not saying no to any job, I was saying no to exponential growth. Yeah. So there's there's a tip for you. When when you don't narrow down and figure out what one or two things, types of things you want to make, you're saying no to a lot more money than just the immediate <laughs> sale. Yeah. You're saying no to potential growth because you just can't, I'm sorry, you just can't build a huge business uh, by being a handyman or doing a ton of different things. Building a big business, doing a lot of different things is way, 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 way harder than just picking one or two categories of things and getting really good at those. Benny Wade likes to say, be the steakhouse, not the buffet. Mm -hmm. If you're a steakhouse, people will trust you to grill chicken and that chicken will probably be better than what the buffet has to offer. So be known for one or two things. And then if you want to stray outside and take another job because you need some cash, people are going to be more willing to accept your credibility there than if you're just always the guy that builds everything. So if you're struggling about what to, what to make, pick the one or two things that you really enjoy making the most and go talk to people until you find enough people that need that thing. Yeah. Look what came in the mail today. Ta-da. Stud stack tumblers. Check that out. Isn't that cool? We also got some stud stack stickers. Yeah. We got a new and improved stud stack sticker. In addition to these, we also have some hats coming. Yeah. So these are all things we send you for free when your business hits certain milestones in the stud stack. That's also how you get your pin up on the wall wherever you live. We wanna be your biggest cheerleaders because encouragement is the most important ingredient when you're trying to grow a business. You don't need to listen to your crazy uncle who thinks what you do in your garage is very cute. I had a boss like that in the military. It was infuriating to be around him. You need to spend time with people that are doing what you wanna be doing and encouraging you to grow and improve. And that's exactly what the stud stack is all about. So if you sell what you make and you're looking for a community of people that understands what you do and wants to encourage you and celebrate all your victories, the stud stack is the best place on the internet for you to be. We've worked really hard to make it cheaper than dog food to join. So check out the link below if you want to learn more and enjoy the rest of this free video. Oh, do you remember how much sleep we used to lose the night before a big furniture delivery? Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> We'd just be laying there like, did you pack the extra stain? Did you pack the rags? Did you pack the markers? Oh, you were thinking Towels? about that? I was thinking about like a crack that I maybe remembered when I first was cutting down the lumber and did oh I fill my. it with epoxy and is it gonna explode and make the whole thing fall apart? Like I was on some irrational fears. Oh my God. I'm glad you were focused on the packing list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was always worried about the like, what happens if we scratch it in the truck on the way there. And it's always hard because as a maker, you see the project from beginning to end. You see every single imperfection. When everybody else sees the beauty and the perfection at the end, you're sitting there like, 
oh, I remember that one thing. I had to sand that down three times. I hope it's perfectly smooth now because I remember three weeks ago it was the worst. I hope they don't run their hand over it in this direction and this lighting, otherwise they're they gonna hate it. Stand on their hands and look at it upside down and notice that one thing in the back corner. Yeah, that kind of stuff. But it's a curse. That's the that's the maker's curse, is mm -hmm. you can't see the project for what it is. You only see it for its imperfections. And I lost a lot of sleep on that when we were starting to deliver larger custom furniture pieces and we were charging a profit. I just felt like there was more on the line. Remember those cabinets that we built for our uh, real estate broker, Tommy? Yes. So we built these two beautiful walnut cabinets. Mm -hmm. Like at this point, I was very experienced in building custom furniture. It was the last two custom pieces we that actually we made. ever did. And I knew they were good, but I still, I still lost sleep over it, which is so stupid because he was so happy when we delivered it. And I every know. time we go to his house for like Bible study, he's always bragging about our like tables that we made. I still see the imperfections every time yeah. we go, but he has never once seen them and I'm not going to point them out to him, but and can we can we just appreciate this? Over six years, we have never had anybody want to return one of those furniture pieces that you lost so much sleep about. Oh, that's so true. You have to look at the ratio of like positive to negative. Like how many negative things did we actually hear back where it did need to be fixed, where they did want to return it? That many. How many positive things did we get back? My husband loved it so much he was in tears. My wife took so many pictures and shared it all over Instagram. The wife started crying when she came into the kitchen and saw the table. Like, you know, you really got to pay attention to both sides of the scoreboard. Yeah. Because you will assign lots of negative points to the negative side of the scoreboard just in your own head instead of paying attention to all the positive things on the good side of the scoreboard. Yeah, think about Gabe. You remember Gabe, his his living room furniture that we yes. made? Yes. He literally like corners people and tries to get them to buy our furniture now. It's so funny. Anytime anybody compliments his coffee table or his like end table, he's like, you know, Smart Table Company made those for me. And if you need anything, they're the ones you're going to call. And we're like, she calm down. He's like, no, they need to know that they need to call you. He is like our best salesman. It's hilarious. Oh, it's great. It's so fun. But yeah, and again, when I look at his furniture, all I see are the imperfections. So so it, it's just crazy. Your brain's gonna play tricks on you. You're never gonna think that you're good enough, at least if you're like us. Um, and I just wanna encourage those of you out there that deal with that sickness. Um, hi, still have it and uh, it never goes away, but you can look at both sides of the scoreboard. And I, I know that your stuff, no matter how much experience you have, if you are in North America and you are making things with tools you bought at the store, I know for a fact it's better quality than most of what you can see at the furniture store. So I don't want you to lose sleep over the quality of your work. I want you to continue to grow and get better and improve your skills, but I don't want you to let that be a limiting factor for starting your business because there's a customer at every price point and every quality level. What you do is already perfect for somebody else. They're literally coming to you because they can't make it themselves and they don't know anybody else who could make it for them. So your set of skills and what you're able to build for them is perfect for what they need. So don't go chasing perfection. Just go find the customers who are in need of what you already make. And I promise you'll make more money. So another thing that literally took us forever to figure out, but once we did, it unlocked a whole new like sales method and so many new opportunities for us. We never used to truly know why people bought our furniture. We thought it was because it was high quality yeah. or they wanted to support us. Or it was pretty. And all those things are true. All those things are reasons why they bought. But the, the main reason that they went with us instead of what was at the furniture store was because they wanted furniture that wouldn't get destroyed when they moved. See, a lot of our friends that were buying our furniture were in the military. And when you move every couple of years, you don't want your nice stuff to get destroyed. A lot of people in the military wait until they retire to buy nice furniture because they don't want the moving companies to destroy it the next 10 years. So when we started advertising that our furniture was move proof, all of a sudden, all of our friends wanted some. The oil guys that also moved across the country a lot, they started reaching out. They wanted to buy stuff from us. Back then our minds were blown. We're like, seriously? This whole time, that's why they actually wanted the furniture. They wanted the furniture because it was move proof. Had I known that, that's how I would have been advertising this whole time. So what we took away from that and what we still use in our sales method and our current business right now is, what problem is the customer having? And how does our product solve it for them? And now when we go to sell it, we package it up in terms that they understand in accordance with the problem they're having. Right, so don't even think about what the project is. Don't sell a thing. Stop thinking about your work in terms of, is it coffee tables or kitchen tables? Well, do you want families to come together around what you make? Okay, 
Sounds like you're gonna sell coffee tables and kitchen tables. Don't put the cart before the horse. Mm -hmm. The product you make needs to solve a problem for the customer. If you don't know what problem it's solving, mm -hmm. then you have no idea why you're making sales. So figure it out, look at the past couple of things that you've sold and really get to the bottom of what problem did this person have and why did my thing perfectly solve that problem? And if you have accomplished this by accident, congratulations, that is so cool. If you have a product right now that you're, you're thinking like, oh my gosh, if a light bulb just went off for you or you're like, oh my gosh, that's why everybody's been buying that thing from me off Etsy, holy cow. Use that to your advantage and sell it now as yep. a problem solving solution. <laughs> Go change the title of your product to be the solution. Like let's say you make signs for new mothers uh, to put up in their nursery with the baby's name mm -hmm. engraved in it. Instead of saying uh, personalized wooden sign with baby name, maybe call it perfect gift for new mother's first nursery. Again, you're solving the problem. You're not just describing what it is that you make. Again, you're gonna to have to sharpen a pencil, write a few ideas out and see what resonates best with your customers. But if you can, if I can just get you to focus on solving a problem for someone instead of figuring out what to make and sell, uh, that's gonna make you so much more money so much faster. So don't sell a thing, solve a problem. All right, price high. This is probably the lesson that we are most famous for on our YouTube channel. From the very beginning, the lesson we have learned is raise your prices, raise your prices, raise your prices, raise your prices. When we first started building stuff, I would take my friend to Home Depot <laughs> and I would pull all the lumber on one of those orange carts and we'd walk to checkout and I would buy everything I needed for that project. I specifically remember I built a, uh, a desk for this guy's gaming computer and we would walk to the checkout counter and I would say, okay, man, like here's the bill. And it was like $120 <laughs> yeah, or something yeah. for all the lumber. And I just had him swipe his credit card and I was like, all right, man, I'll deliver the table in a couple of weeks. I didn't charge him a dime. For the labor or building or delivery, you would literally just have him pay for materials there at Home Depot and then nothing thereafter. I didn't realize I was running a charity. <laughs> I, I, it was my hobby and I thought I would just be reimbursed for the, the stuff. And like, those, those are fun projects. I really enjoyed mm -hmm. doing those. I'm glad I did those. I'm yeah. not upset that I, I did those things. It's just- Cause you learned a lot. I just didn't realize I was running a charity. And had somebody told me I was running a charity and not a business, I probably would have priced a little higher a little sooner. So, right. um, and again, the higher we've raised our prices, the less our customers push back on price. Correct. The more money we make, the more I want to raise my prices. And this is a very similar trend. If you if you watch any other business content on the internet, like business owners from all other industries are saying the same thing. There is a customer at every price point. Mm -hmm. So why not chase the customers at the highest price point? That's where you make the most money. That's where you can solve the biggest problem. That's where you can help the most people. That's where you can hire the most employees and offer benefit. Like, if you want to grow a business, if you want to seriously grow a business, or you really want to have a comfortable retirement or whatever it is that you're starting a business for, I think you should chase the higher end customers. Mm -hmm. I, I just do. They don't put up much of a fight. They're, like the, the lower you, the price of your stuff, the more people are going to fight you on price. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Would you say crazy. that's true? Like, yeah, absolutely. I've had customers who have only, like for us, we sell cutting boards, right? I've had customers who have only ever bought one single cutting board and they put up more of a fight than some of our customers who have bought over a hundred in their lifetime with us as a customer. And they have been some of the easiest people in the whole wide world to work with. They never have a single problem. But yet the people who have only bought one, spent the least amount of money with us, have probably caused us the most amount of problems. Yep, so do yourself a favor, uh, price higher than you think you should, and then raise it again. Um, man, I just, everybody everybody is not charging enough. Just across, I'm speaking in broad strokes, across the maker community, we're just not charging enough. We're just not. And I think, I think a lot of that it stems from a really positive portion of our personalities. I feel like as makers and as creatives, we enjoy what we do and we so badly just wanna share that with the rest of the world, which is so great. I wanna encourage you to keep doing that. That is amazing. Keep sharing your skills, but you've gotta be reimbursed for that too, for your time. Um, I know you find a lot of joy in building things in your garage and sharing it with people all over the planet and all over the country, but joy is not necessarily a form of payment. And if you truly want your passion, you want your hobby to be able to pay for things like travel, that last minute trip to go see family, um, to go to a country you've never been before, you've got to be reimbursed monetarily for your time and materials and everything like that. Uh, even if you just want to help more people, like mm -hmm. if you want to help more people, you need to buy more 
more tools to build more things mm -hmm. to help more people. So eventually I started charging for labor. The first couple of projects on our YouTube channel were, I guess we broke even on those because we were charging for materials and labor. I hadn't quite got to that point where I was adding margin or markup to yeah. so that the business could profit. And then by the time we got to uh, your friend Danny's desk, we had it dialed in pretty mm -hmm. well and we did really well. I think we're gonna have a video about that project coming up pretty yeah. soon. All along the way, we could have charged at that pricing formula. And that's right. the pricing formula we recommend now. If you're struggling to figure out how to price your work, you can go to jennydavis.com slash price my work. It's totally free. We got a little calculator there for you. And all you gotta do is put on how much the materials cost, and how many hours it took you to make the thing, and it'll spit out a price for you. And that's the minimum price that we recommend you charge for your stuff. Our friends uh, months later would tell us how they felt guilty for how little they paid us for the furniture that we made. So little did we know, we were actually making them feel uncomfortable by how little we were charging them for it. And we're like, Oh, so we overcorrected in the wrong direction. Either side you overcorrect on, people are gonna feel uncomfortable. If you, you know, charge them way too much, everybody's gonna feel uncomfortable. But if you, you know, don't charge them enough, they're gonna feel bad too. So you've gotta find that sweet spot where everybody feels like they're winning, essentially. And the last point, it took us so long to understand that fair price goes both ways. Not only does it need to be fair for the customer, needs to be fair to the person that made it too. And like Jenny said, joy is not a form of payment and you need to have a little bit more money left over after you've paid for materials and the labor to build it. Don't sell your time to people who don't value it enough. You're worth way more than that. You've worked so hard to learn these skills on how to make these things. Don't sell yourself short, but believe me, somebody is always gonna complain about your price. Let's give them something to complain about. So in summary, price high because you are worth it and price is honestly pretty arbitrary. So hopefully these stories have given you some ideas of what to do in your business moving forward. Using wisdom to change your behavior is honestly the hardest part because all of us wanna just continue doing what we've been doing. Making a change can be really uncomfortable and difficult. So jump in the stud stack if you want some encouragement and you wanna hear even more stories from us and some other business owners. Subscribe and share this video if you wanna see more like this for free on YouTube and we'll see you on the next one.